that yours? Uh, so we'll get her another one. Hello. This is what it feels like when I uh, start my class. I, 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 tr I walk in, start talking, and people just keep talking. The students don't, they don't bother stopping. I, 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 so I appreciate this. It feels really familiar. Um, <laughs> thanks. So um, thanks for being here. My name is Matt Totolo. I'm a professor of law at WVU, and I have the honor of introducing the introducer who's going to introduce uh, our keynote speaker. Um, but before I introduce him, I'd like to acknowledge all the hard work that's, uh, that's gone into putting this uh, symposium together. And the original idea for this symposium came from the folks at the Law Review, who I think wanted to build on the successes of our new uh, Appalachian Justice Initiative. Um, so I wanted to talk about just that for a minute. Um, and then uh, uh, I will turn, turn it over to the dean. Um, Faculty at the West Virginia University College of Law started the Appalachian Justice Initiative uh, very soon after the 2016 election. And as we say in our statement of purpose uh, for the initiative, this election cycle has cast a bright light on the decades old fact that our economically disenfranchised neighbors generally and our Appalachian brothers and sisters living in poverty specifically have been left behind by the entire American political establishment. And the statement goes on to explain the core values that I think went into the decision to create the Appalachian Justice Initiative in the first place. Um, we say, because we live in Appalachia, because we work at West Virginia's largest land-grant university and West Virginia's only law school, uh, because we provide pro bono legal services to indigent and financially distressed Appalachians, uh, because we believe that service to our state is our mandate and duty, and uh, because we believe that law schools, legal education, and legal scholarship can and should be relevant again. And I urge you to check out the website if you haven't seen, uh, seen it, um, where we, can, uh, we highlight the good work that folks uh, in this building are doing, uh, whether it's Professor Aliva's work in the Veterans Advocacy, Advocacy Clinic, um, Professor Ellis's scholarship on voting rights, Professor, uh, Professor Blake's writing on the opioid uh, uh, epidemic, uh, Professor Beattie's leadership in the Innocence Project, uh, Professor Baskaran's work on economic development in Appalachia, and of course I could go on and on. Um, I will not, um, but do take a look at that. Do take a look at the website. Um, it's not a mistake that we've been ranked by national jurists as the number two law school in the country for greatest community impact. Um, as a community of scholars and practitioners, we are deepening our expertise on the many issues that face modern Appalachia, and we are greatly expanding our already impressive outreach efforts to the wider community. Um, all of that, really, to, to uh, all that to make those statements of principle I just talked about a reality. Um, before introducing Dean Bowman, I would like to thank the folks at the West Virginia Law Review, led by Rebecca Trump. Um, who was just fantastic to work with um, for their incredible hard work and dedication in putting together this terrific event. Um, anybody who has worked on a conference or a symposium can tell you it is no easy thing to do. It is a lot of work, uh, a lot of hours, and a lot of dedication. So um, would you guys mind standing um, for some applause? I hope that's not... Uh, Thank you so much. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, the William J. Um, Meyer, Dean of the West Virginia University College of Law, Gregory Bowman. Um, dean Bowman was appointed Dean of the WVU College of Law in May of 2015 after serving uh, as interim dean. He is a nationally recognized scholar in international trade law and remedies and joined the faculty in 2009. He is also a native West Virginian, uh, you can tell from the tie, uh, and a graduate of WVU summa cum laude in international studies and economics. He received his JD cum laude from the Northwestern University School of Law and received the award for outstanding teaching from the WVU Foundation in 2014, as well as being named the Professor of the Year in 2011 by WVU law students 
along with other accomplishments too numerous to list. Um, prior to his teaching career, uh, Dean Bowman practiced law in Chicago and Washington, uh, and Washington, D.C. with the international law firm of Baker and McKenzie. Uh, Dean Bowman will introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Lisa Pruitt. So join me in welcoming Dean Bowman to the podium. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, I actually think you took my notes. <laughs> I only, I only had the verbs memorized and the nouns were going to be missing, so I decided to get the notes back. Well, thank you very much, Matt, for that kind introduction and for the, the very important words about the Appalachian Justice Initiative. That is the kind of initiative that represents the very best uh, in higher education and in legal education, uh, not just in the U.S., but in the world. Uh, we have a group of passionate, brilliant, committed, dedicated, hardworking, highly capable professors who want to pull together and help make the world a better place. Uh, and that's very important. Uh, and they have partnered with the students and the law review <clears throat> to help make this symposium a reality. And it has been a, magnif a magnificent symposium so far. We're very excited and very proud. And that kind of partnership, that kind of working with our future colleagues before the bar uh, is uh, a hallmark feature of, of the best law schools in the U.S. and certainly of West Virginia University as well. I will also say, um, uh, uh, Matt said that we are indeed, uh, we have been um, ranked as the number two law school in the nation for community impact, and I was so excited when I did that, or when we did that, and I went down to the, uh, the provost uh, in, on the downtown campus, Joyce McConnell, who, for those of you who don't know, is a former dean of the College of Law. And I told her, I said, we're number two in the nation in terms of community impact. And she said, well, who's number one? And I said, well, the University of Idaho. And she said, oh, they're not that good. So, um, but we didn't demand a recount, but we think we're number one. <laughs> so in any event, uh, thank you very much for being here uh, at the symposium and the dinner. We are really proud uh, to host this. We're really proud of what the, the AJI has done uh, and the Law Review uh, has done for the Symposium on Appalachian Justice. Um, the student editors on the Law Review and many of our faculty have worked very hard uh, to develop uh, and make this symposium a reality, and I think that this symposium stands out for both the depth of discussion and for the breadth of topics that have been addressed today and will be addressed tomorrow. Uh, it speaks well of our law school, it speaks well for our state, it speaks well for our commitment to service and to justice. And for those of you who are participating in the symposium, and many of you are in the room, thank you very, very much for your commitment. Uh, thank, for, thank you for your very important work uh, in helping to make the world a better place. So it is indeed my honor and my privilege tonight to announce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Lisa Pruitt, whose career has spanned the globe literally and figuratively. She practiced law abroad for nearly 10 years, negotiating cultural conflicts around the world. Uh, she has done work in more than 30 countries, uh, both in private practice and on behalf of international organizations. And hers is a truly multifaceted global career. She has served, for example, as a gender consultant for the International Criminal Tribunal in Rwanda, as a legal assistant in the Netherlands for the U.S for the Iran-U.S. Claims Tribunal, and as an associate in London with the international law firm of Covington and Berlin. And she has also written extensively about rural women in the developing world, and she's a leading expert on rural poverty. Her scholarship focuses on rural difference and rural invisibility in relation to the law. And she contends that much in lawmaking and in legal scholarship relates more to urban norms and standards than to rural settings, and that is something, I think, to which many of us in this room in Appalachia can relate. A common theme in Dr. Pruitt's research concerns how legal institutions, as well as the law itself, manage and respond to cultural differences and cultural change. Her work considers the intersection of law with rural livelihoods, including how the characteristics of rural locations profoundly shape the lives of residents living there and when and how 
they encounter the law. This is work that is relevant both globally and locally, and I think it is profoundly important. Dr. Pruitt is currently the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Law at the University of California Davis School of Law. The courses she teaches include law and rural livelihoods, working class whites and the law, feminist legal theory, and sociology in the legal profession. Dr. Pruitt earned her undergraduate and JD degrees from the University of Arkansas, and she earned her PhD from the University of London, where she studied as a British Marshall Scholar. So please join me in giving Dr. Pruitt a warm Appalachian welcome. That was such a wonderful, um, generous introduction, um, and it reminded me of some parts of my life that I don't think about much anymore, um, because after all of those wonderful years abroad, uh, when I often joke, <clears throat> I became as cosmopolitan as I was ever going to become, um, I, I have arguably been regressing, <laughs> um, due to no fault of California, um, but um, those many really amazing opportunities I had to work abroad um, really um, provided such a sharp contrast to my own upbringing in rural Arkansas and are really a huge part of the impetus for what I've been doing um, for about the last 15 years. So um, first of all, warm, warm thanks and gratitude to Rebecca and her team. You all have been incredibly hospitable. Um, it's terrific to be here with so many old WVU friends, um, and um, so I'm just, it's, it's lovely to be here. I'm just very, very, um, very, very grateful for this invitation and for this opportunity. Um, and I've learned so much today, uh, and I knew I would, um, which is why I said I want to make sure I'm there for the whole thing. I want to, um, to get the benefit of this wonderful interdisciplinary event that you have, uh, that you have pulled together. Um, I'm a huge advocate of interdisciplinarity, which I may say a little bit more about, um, about later. So um, let me start with a few words of introduction for my slideshow. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna do something a little bit different, but first of all, I'm going to take you, well, actually the whole thing, for the most part, is a rural, is, a, is an Appalachian travel log. Um, so, um, so let me just, yeah, let me jump in and show you my first visit to West Virginia. Uh, so here I am in 2009, <laughs> crossing over from uh, Virginia uh, near the, uh, near Lewisburg and uh, with my sweet son who wasn't quite five and uh, there we are at the New River Gorge. Um, so I'm trying to establish, right, my Appalachian bona fides here. Um, and then uh, here I am, my last visit. Um, uh, Professor Ree and Jenna took me out to Cheat Lake and uh, showed me around. So that was my last visit to Morgantown. Um, and then this is my last visit to West Virginia. That's my son, I guess he was 11 by then, at Harper's Ferry about two years ago. So... Um, and that's, this is what really establishes my rural bona fides. <laughs> um, so I am not, um, uh, one of the intimidating things about coming here to an Appalachian Justice Conference is that uh, I'm not an Appalachian uh, studies scholar, right? There's this incredibly rich discipline that is Appalachian studies. And, uh, and, and while I write about rural people and I write about working class white people, uh, I, am, I am not, in fact, Appalachian. So I'm, I guess you could say I'm an Appalachian wannabe. Um, I grew up in the Ozark Mountains of uh, Arkansas, and that is me. I'm the girl on the back with my older sister sometime in the late 1960s um, on the farm of our maternal grandparents. <clears throat> I love that photo. And that is my maternal grandfather. Um, and his massive garden that he put in every year until the year he died. Um, my maternal grandpa, that was his workshop. Um, and that is where you could wash your hands, up, also up above the garden. 
Um, my maternal grandparents got indoor plumbing after I finished law school, so sometime in the, uh, in the early 1990s. And so very often when I have tried to explain to people where I came from, uh, I have wound up saying, well, it's this very sparsely populated county in the Arkansas Ozarks, and there are 8,000 people and blah, blah, blah. And then I, find it, I wind up saying, do you have an image of Appalachia? And they're kind of like, yeah. I'm like, okay, that's it, right? <laughs> so when I say I'm an Appalachian wannabe, I guess that's really what I'm, what I'm saying. I grew up in a place that I think is very much like Appalachia. And one of the ways that it's like Appalachia um, is um, persistent poverty. So persistent poverty is a federal government um, designation. Uh, it's a county-level designation for places that have had high poverty rates. So poverty rate above 20% for each of the last four decennial censuses. So you can see where the persistent poverty counties are. You can see that most of them are non-metropolitan. So they are basically rural counties. Persistent poverty is fundamentally, when you're looking at it at the scale of the county, which is what the federal government does, um, it is uh, mostly a rural phenomenon. And I'm gonna talk about um, white socioeconomic disadvantage. I'm going to talk about white poverty tonight. Um, and um, so I wanted to show you this slide to be intentional about the fact that there are four racial or ethnic groups that are highly impacted by persistent poverty. And you can see where they are. They're the colonias in the Rio Grande Valley. They are basically Indian country in the West and the Southwest. They are the Mississippi Delta and the Black Belt. And they are Appalachia and the Ozarks. So you see those two little counties up in Northwest Arkansas that are persistent poverty counties. Mine, well, you probably can't tell there are two of them, but there are, and mine is the, uh, the westernmost one. Um, and then, of course, you see uh, some similar, um, similar dynamics in, uh, in eastern Oklahoma, although, again, there you're getting into Indian populations. Um, and this also reminds me to mention uh, what was the image on that first slide, which you probably have some familiarity with, right? That was LBJ's visit to Appalachia when he was uh, launching the war on poverty in the 1960s. So those um, images of impoverished whites in, uh, in Appalachia. So that's sort of the preliminaries, if you will. Um, the rest of the photos, and I've got a bunch of them, um, are going to turn over about every 15 or 20 seconds, and they are not necessarily going to relate <laughs> directly to what I'm talking about, but these are mostly photos that I have taken either um, in parts of Appalachia, stretching all the way to New Hampshire, which by some accounts, right, the White Mountains of New Hampshire are part of Appalachia, depends on, you know, whose definition you're looking at. Um, but I have to admit that I've also slipped in some slides from other states, um, including a lot from actually my home county. This one is, is from my home county. Um, and I'm guessing that you're not going to be able to tell when you're looking at Appalachia and when you're looking at the Ozarks. There's even a few in there of rural California. So if you look closely at the the types of trees you might figure out, or if, you, if you're able to see license plates, you'll, you'll be able to figure out. But anyway, this sort of, to sort of set the stage for what I'm gonna talk about um, this evening. So, um, and, and I also do wanna admit that a few of these I've taken from uh, national media, uh, but only a few. Um, so after I accepted this very kind invitation to give this uh, address, I have to admit that I kinda got cold feet and um, I got cold feet not because uh, I didn't love the topic and I didn't love the idea of an Appalachian Justice uh, Symposium, but really because, as I said earlier, I'm not an Appalachian, I'm not an Appalachian Studies scholar. And from what I've read of this literature, it is so incredibly rich 
and, and wide ranging that I thought, oh my goodness, I can't possibly you know, do justice uh, to this topic. Um, so I found it a really intimidating uh, topic, uh, but then I thought about the justice part, and that part was also really intimidating because, of course, I'm a law professor, and law professors do law, which is not necessarily synonymous with doing justice, as much as we might like to think, right, that you know, law is about justice. We have to acknowledge that these are not necessarily um, synonymous. But I do aspire to do justice, and it is that aspiration that led me to start writing in this field um, that I call Law and Rural Livelihoods about a dozen years ago. It's also an aspiration to do justice that led me to start writing about working class whites um, more explicitly about five years ago. So you don't have to spend much time wallowing around in rural stuff, right, to come to the understanding that if you're going to write about rural, you're going to be writing about disadvantage, rural disadvantage. You're going to be writing about rural poverty. That's a big part of it, unless you're on the western slope in Colorado, and then everything's in gentrification, right? But a really, really huge part of what it means to be a rural scholar is to write about disadvantage. And that led me back to um, you know, writing about working class whites, about white poverty as well. Um, I grew up in a working class family. And um, so it, it, this journey as a scholar has taken me back there. Um, in fact, a talk I gave here at WVU about five years ago was one of the first talks I gave um, on, you know, sort of breaking out and saying, okay, I'm not under disguise with the rural thing. I'm talking about, you know, white poverty and white socioeconomic uh, disadvantage. And I really appreciated the opportunity to be with this faculty and to have their engagement around these issues. Um, so tonight I want to offer some reflections on the journey of being a scholar who writes about these populations, populations that until Trump was elected were pretty much ignored, and now I fear are just more reviled. Um, I'm not sure that uh, we are experiencing a net gain in terms of um, our attitudes towards these vulnerable populations. So um, at the risk of doing what Professor LaFaso said today, <laughs> admonished us today not to do, right, sort of essentializing Appalachia as rural and, uh, you know, uh, white socioeconomic disadvantage, that's basically what I'm doing. I'm, you know, saying this is the way I'm going to do Appalachian studies is by drawing on this work that I've been doing about these populations. Um, and, of course, a lot of national media would lead us to believe that Appalachia is sort of quintessential rurality. It's sort of the quintessential, um, you know, white socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, as, again, I think it was Professor LaFaso said this evening, you know, the, the uh, national media would have us believe that we are at the epicenter of Trumplandia. Um, and that um, is not entirely true, as we know, if we've looked closely at the exit polls. So I wanted to reflect on the complications of being an advocate for these populations um, because um, I have found it very difficult to be an advocate for these populations without having cast on to me the negative stereotypes that are associated with these populations, at least in my world, right? So I come from a working class background in rural Arkansas, but look at, look at me, look at how I'm dressed. I'm a, I'm a coastal elite now, right? <laughs> I've got a job at this posh law school, um, you know, in California, this, you know, Nirvana. Uh, and um, so um, I, I think what you'll hear me saying is that I kind of have a foot in both camps. Um, and I have, I think, a greater capacity probably to empathize with rural and white working class people, but I also admittedly very much have the perspective of a very um, politically progressive person who is uh, very appalled by Trump. So let's just get it out there because it's going to slip out and um, <laughs> if I, <laughs> we might as well just put it on the table. Um, so 
this is all a bit awkward too because it's very self-reflective. Um, until really a couple of years ago, I was the only legal scholar in the country who was writing um, pretty much exclusively about rural populations. And um, so a lot of what I'm reflecting on is what it means to be a legal scholar who's tried to do this work, which may, uh, which I'm aware has some differences from what it means to maybe be a scholar in another discipline. Um, so um, I've got way too much content here. I need a time, I need somebody to, I need the phone or something so I can see because I don't have a watch. <laughs> How much time I'm taking up? I'll, I'll bring it up. Okay, great. Um, so I've often joked in these years that I have been writing about rural, um, rural people in places that I'm, you know, a little bit like the church lady. Remember her from Saturday Night Live? You know, she was like the woman with the one-track mind, right? It was all, you know, sin and stuff. And so I've sort of been the person for the last 10 years who gets up at law conferences and who says, let's talk about rural people, right? <laughs> and you can sort of see people's responses, you know, like, oh, that's very... Uh, unintellectual or, um, hmm, maybe, you know, the, the best you could hope for is, um, oh, that's kind of exotic, right? So I'm kind of like, you know, I'm kind of like, you know, moderately interested in the way I would be in some, you know, small tribe in Africa, but it really has nothing to do with anything that has to do with, with me. Um, and so kind of, you know, this sort of maybe passing interest. Um, Nevertheless, in my efforts to, thank you, in my efforts to theorize um, the legal relevance of rurality, right, because legal scholars aren't supposed to write about stuff unless it's legally relevant, that's kind of the trick, is you've got to figure out, right, you know, what's the, the legal relevance. I've identified a, a lot of features that I think are legally relevant to how people choose to engage the law, the state, or not. Um, one of them was actually referred to today, and it really warmed the cockles of my heart that someone referred to the high density of acquaintanceship as impacting, right, whether people would choose to avail themselves uh, of, uh, of legal assistance or how they would interact. Um, I usually call that lack of anonymity. I talked about material spatiality, the lack of diversification in rural economies, which was the theme of today's lunch conversation. Attachment to place, it was mentioned, it's been mentioned several times today, and I think it's probably the factor that's least respected by judges and courts, and really also by politicians and commentators. I don't know how many of you read Kevin Williamson's piece um, in the National Review in 2016 that basically said what people in Appalachia need is a U-Haul. Um, so there's a lot of, um, Another feature is sort of skepticism of the state, right? That sort of antipathy towards, um, towards government. And so I've argued that it's worth studying legal phenomena, which are also social phenomena, not just across some, uh, some rural-urban divide, because what we're really grappling with here is a rural-urban continuum. In short, I've argued that rural matters. Indeed, sometimes, more recently, in desperation, I've argued that we need to understand the rural because if we understand the rural, we will understand the center, right? So if people <laughs> want to hear about the rural, then let's talk about what the rural can reveal about the big middle, about the mainstream, about the implicit urban norm. Um, but again, I found that um, most legal scholars um, you know, aren't very interested in rural America. They're not really interested in rural people and places, except perhaps um, the opportunity that rural places um, represent for people to enjoy recreation, right? Some rural sociologists have argued that that's what rurality is going to become. It's going to become the place that we, where we all just go and consume the rural, right, as, as tourists. Um, well, at least people weren't very interested until Trump, and again, I'm going to come back to that. So it's proved really, really challenging to get scholars to pay attention to the rural, and I have lots of anecdotes about how people have published entire books on abortion law and poverty law, and they haven't said a word about the rural, and they haven't cited me, right? So, which, you know, which is kind of a big deal when you're an academic, because your colleagues are going, well, you must not be successful because people aren't citing you. 
And there's not much reflection on sort of the other side of that, right? What about the sort of closed-mindedness of the people who are writing the book on poverty law or the book on abortion law and not saying anything about rural women or about rural circumstances? That's something that they wouldn't do, of course, with respect to urban populations because urban places matter and also because in the Progressive Academy, urban is code for black and brown. And we know that we must not leave them out. And I'm completely in agreement with that, right? But there's not the same obloquy associated with just kind of overlooking uh, rural people or overlooking white poverty. So I've often joked that I've been writing my way into the very obscurity associated with, rur rur with rural America. Uh, and that I have an, an anemic citation count to prove it. Um, the good news after the election, if you could call it that, um, is that I can now say that as our interest in rural America goes, so goes my career, right? <laughs> um, so <laughs> let me give you one anecdote, just because it's so rich and illustrative. A few years ago, actually quite a few years ago, now maybe seven or eight, I came across a piece of new scholarship on SSRN. It's called Food Fights and Food Rights, Legislating the Delicious Revolution. The abstract stated that, quote, the essay explores some of the civil rights and human rights dimensions of American food policy. In particular, the essay examined the problem of food deserts, the dearth of grocery stores and farmers markets in America's poor and non-white urban neighborhoods. These are complex problems involving powerful agricultural interests, difficult public health questions, urban planning, and civil rights. Sounds really interesting, right? But I was surprised and disappointed that in 51 pages, 51 pages, the author did not use the word rural a single time, nor did he use the word non-metropolitan. The word urban, on the other hand, appeared 13 times, more if you count the law review footnotes. He talked about farmers markets, farm policy, the farm bill, farmer Barack, and occasionally plain old farmers, but he did not mention the fact that a whole lot of food is grown in rural or non-metropolitan places. He talked about what's good for cities and urban children without acknowledging rural children, their families, their nutritional needs, their communities, and the fact that many rural places are ironically food deserts. On the one hand, his use of the modifier urban could be seen as progress. That is, by specifying urban, he at least was not pretending to refer to all children when his real focus was on those who live in cities. So at least there's precision and honesty in this. Unlike many legal scholars, he was not merely assuming the urban. He was being explicit about it. Now, I do understand that urban ag, slow food, and Alice Waters are hot topics, and I appreciate that even or especially law review articles need a little marketing. By the way, this was a student at the University of California at Berkeley, so hence the note of Shea Panisse and Alice Waters. Still, given that food, in, food insecurity and child obesity are problems that plague rural places as much as urban ones, um, I was disappointed. So the bottom line is that rural people in places have been incredibly easy to overlook as we rush pell-mell through the second decade of a highly urban-centric 21st century. Ditto the white working class, sometimes referred to euphemistically as the white middle class, who seemed to draw media attention only during election season. The chattering class's widespread obliviousness to rural America is referred to in book and article titles like Hidden America, The Forgotten Fifth. In late 2016, the Washington Post reported on Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack's, quote, lonely fight for a forgotten rural America. And NPR recently referred to rural places in relation to the physician shortage as forgotten America. One journalist has referred to the rural Ohio River Valley region in southern Illinois as forsaken, to which I say at least the journalist didn't say God forsaken. So then there's the same phenomenon with respect to working class whites. Texaria and Rogers asserted nearly two decades ago in their book, The Forgotten Majority, Why the White Working Class Still Matters, that this group is often ignored, though they made up 55% of the electorate. Bell Hooks' 2000 book, Where We Stand, Class Matters, featured a chapter titled White Poverty, The Politics of Invisibility. Arlie Hochschild's most recent book, Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger and Mourning in the American Right, which was published in 2016, shortly before the election, 
offers a metaphor for how socioeconomically disadvantaged whites view their situation in relation to others. They see themselves standing in line, working hard, waiting for their turn, for some socioeconomic security, for the opportunity to get ahead, but it isn't happening. Their time has not yet come. They feel not only invisible, but they also perceive themselves as losing ground, as falling behind other groups, other constituencies that they see as cutting in line. These others include immigrants, racial minorities, and even the brown pelican, which is protected by environmental laws, thus undermining their employment opportunities. So um, I spent a lot of time recently reading these so-called Trump country uh, journalistic tourists, um, and I, it's, I'm tempting to just do a whole talk on that, but I'm just gonna give you uh, a few snippets. One of my favorite Trump country tourists, um, who's the journalist, is Alec McGillis, who, whose name you may recognize as he's the author of the, um, the biography of Mitch McConnell. <laughs> Uh, it's not a very flattering biography. Um, so he, he now writes for ProPublica, and he um, published a feature story a few days after the 2016 election when most, when most progressives were really in shock, right? He'd gone back to an Ohio community that he visited just before the election to hear their reflections on the outcome. One female blue-collar union member uh, whom McGillis had interviewed uh, before the election, commented on her, on her perceived invisibility and that of the milieu in which she lives in recent years. She said, I wanted people like me to be cared about. People don't realize there's nothing without a blue collar worker. And I've got lots of other examples from this genre that I could share, but that would take all evening. I just wanna say it would be easy to write these folks off as whiners, nutcases, or worse, racist, and that is, in fact, what I see in much mainstream media commentary and even more commonly on my Twitter feed. After all, they're white, and everyone knows whites have all the power and money. The world sees and cares about whites. Whites are not burdened by racial animus directed at them, nor are whites' life prospects undermined by structural racism. Or so the story goes in my world. We progressive elites know well the spiel about white privilege. But I think we would do well to pause and think a bit more critically about the situation. We might pause and ask whether we really do see those whites, many of whom are what Camille Gear Rich, a professor at the University of Southern California, has called marginal whites. As many of you know, low-income, low-education whites are not feeling the love, and they're living very little of the privilege. In short, they don't qualify for, they don't have access to, many of the touted perks of whiteness. They are not actually in the club any more than Jews, Irish Americans, or Italian Americans were at one time because the category of whiteness has evolved. Yet in the five or so years I've been writing about poor and working class whites, I find that I annoy a lot of people. <laughs> Sometimes it feels like I annoy everyone who comes within earshot or reads my work. Um, I am very clear that I am not suggesting that we look at bias against poor whites to the exclusion of bias against people of color, quite the contrary, but I have not found it possible to attract empathic attention to rural and working class whites. I have mostly sought to do so by attending critical race conferences, but also events like class crits, which I think is gonna be here next year. Um, I have couched the inquiry as an aspect of critical whiteness studies, a sort of subcategory of critical race theory. I've said that I'm looking at working class whites as a critical race project, which I actually think is the way that we should study them. I think that what we need to be looking at is what exactly is at the intersection of white skin privilege and socioeconomic disadvantage. So let's not just say we're talking about class as a default, let's talk about this intersection and by the way, there's some really interesting uh, comments being made by scholars and commentators these days um, that, um, that are suggesting that for this population, whiteness is a burden because people around them are looking at them if they're, for example, suffering an opioid addiction, saying, what's the deal? You're white. 
You're, you know, everything should be all right. You must really be a big failure if you can't keep it together and you've got white skin privilege. So the responses that I get usually fall into three categories. Um, again, this is mostly at critical race conferences, which is not to say that these conferences are only attended by people of color, but there's, first of all, the eye rolling, <laughs> which is typically, again, among uh, critical race scholars, which I guess, which I tend to read as they're certain that I can't possibly understand my own white privilege, and I suppose they're right. Most of us walking around with white privilege can't completely grasp that. Um, two, there are the people who resist the notion that poor whites experience any significant disadvantage. It was interesting today, sitting in on the um, rural schools panel and talking, hearing some of the detail about the, the schools in uh, rural West Virginia, and I know I went to a pretty crummy school in rural Arkansas, um, and it reminded me of a conversation I had with a scholar several years ago at a critical race theory conference in Los Angeles. And she just wanted to go to the mat with me on how the school I attended could not possibly have, have could not possibly have been as crappy as the urban school she attended in New York City. It's like, I mean, at some point I'm like, okay, whatever. It is not, but that brings me to the third point, right? And that is this desire to rank oppressions, this desire to have a contest and say, because black and brown people always have it worse off, we don't have time to be concerned about poor whites. And it seems to me that that's kind of, you know, one of the ways that we got to the situation that we're in. Um, the other, I guess I'm now on four, maybe those two and three were related. Uh, the other um, response I get is from the people who feel like they need to give me a history lesson, a lesson about the decisions that poor whites made after the Civil War to align themselves with rich whites rather than their black brothers and sisters. This is something that's been referred to today. It's obviously a very, very um, important, um, significant historical moment, if you will. So people say, ah, oh, read C. Van Woodward and W.B. Du Bois and David Rodiger, right? Uh, in a way that assumes that I've never read these people and I don't know any of this history. So the implication seems to be that if I knew about this historical foolishness, and I do think it's foolishness, of low-income whites, low-status whites, I would just shut up and go home. Um, and in that, I see so much pessimism. There is so much pessimism, so little optimism that anything could actually uh, change. And the other thing I see, which I'm just flummoxed by every day, and that is this annoying tendency to let rich whites off the hook. We're foisting all the blame onto poor whites, and rich whites don't really have to own any of it. And that's a point that I hope I'll have a few minutes to come back to. So it's this impulse um, that we uh, have seen, this impulse to blame poor low-income whites for a lack of, of cross-race coalition building that we've really seen blossom also in the wake of Trump's election. Never mind that the income ban that voted for Trump by the greatest margin are those who earn between fifty dollars and $100,000 a year, which some people would say is middle income, right? And then if you look at, you know, how many rich whites voted for Trump, I mean, it's, well, the word I would use is disgusting. Um, but the media are focused on the rural and the low-income whites, and there simply aren't enough of them <laughs> to have done this dastardly deed all by themselves. So post-election, rural and white working class folks have become really unpopular, even toxic in my world, the world of progressive elites. I see both groups ridiculed daily on my Twitter feed, the very worst assumed of them, all painted with the broad brush of ignorance and, again, far more damning racism. There's a tendency to assert that everyone who voted for Trump is a racist and to dismiss economic anxiety as a motivation for having voted for Trump. Just one example, the Charlottesville riots. There were white supremacists who marched in Charlottesville. That does not mean that everyone who voted for Trump is a white supremacist. 
and yet to look at my Twitter feed, that was exactly the assumption that was made. People saying, don't ever let it be, credible journalists, I thought they were credible journalists, saying things like, don't ever let it be said again that this was about economic anxiety. So we're conflating everybody who voted for Trump with the people who marched in Charlottesville? Really? Now, I have no time. I mean, don't even get me started on white supremacists. But are we really doing ourselves, our nation, a favor, right, by calling everybody who voted for Trump an incorrigible racist, a white supremacist? So I think we need a different response. When people are as mad and, dis and feeling disenfranchised, and I'll admit that a lot of this is about how they feel, it's about their perceptions, it's not all about reality, but we have to meet them where they are. Um, when people are this mad, mad enough to vote for a candidate as deeply problematic as Donald Trump, we might do more than roll our eyes and call them lunatics. Although, I'll admit, my own knee-jerk instinct is to do just that. We might ask why they're so mad. We might listen to them with as much empathy as we can possibly muster in the hope of understanding how they and we got to this profoundly polarized place and time. We might ask why we didn't see this coming. We might ask why and how we lost sight of rural and working class whites as populations other than reality TV fodder. What hides them from us, or at least from people like me, coastal elites? Is it, socio is it socio-spatiality, the increasing social and geographic distance across class, what Bill Bishop has called the big sort? Or is the chasm as much a consequence of time as space? Some of us, particularly those of us who are white, once knew some working class white folks. From our lofty perches amidst the chattering classes, we like to reminisce about the father or grandfather who went to college on the GI Bill after World War II, right? This American dream narrative that we're so attached to. But most in the world where I now abide are at least second or third generation college graduates who take for granted that status to one degree or another. Most progressive elites are also now removed from the rural. Even the grandparents or great-grandparents that we or our parents might reminisce about visiting on the old family homestead are now nothing more than photos in the family album. In the 21st century, most now encounter rurality only as tourists who are consuming it. And by the way, I've heard a lot about how important tourism is to West Virginia today. That's great. But the election of 2016 has made these groups harder to overlook, and it has given media attention, or pardon me, given the media attention to the rural and white working class support for Donald Trump. In my world, this has proved a double-edged sword. Rural people are now more seen, but also more disdained, I would say, and arguably no better understood. In fact, the 2016 election appears to have heightened elite derision toward rural Americans, toward those in flyover states, towards those presumed to have voted for Trump, whether or not they actually did. Ditto, again, the white working class. By way of illustration, in early 2017, about a year ago, I gave a workshop on a paper at my law school, a paper about environmental degradation by an industrial hog farm in my home community in the Arkansas Ozarks. In response, one of my colleagues asked why he or she should care about these poor white people whose health will be compromised by the massive hog operation and whose economic well-being is likely to be undermined because it's a county that's also dependent on tourism. It was not the question I was expecting, and I don't recall what I said except that I was conflict avoidant. Later, my colleague clarified by email, quote, I apologize for asking an aggressive question. It occurs to me that some of these people were quite powerful in some domains, even exercising electoral power over California and me in the last election. But power's complicated, and the situation is complicated. As you outlined, there's more than one model of economic justice. So at least he or she was honest about the visceral reaction, though in a subsequent exchange, that person also opined that one of the problems is that the white working class are trying to have it both ways, and at least rich whites are honest about their motivations. What this colleague seemed to overlook or discount is the disproportionate power of rich whites who have far greater opportunities and resources to affect change. In my experience, that's a surprisingly common oversight. 
We are anxious to cast responsibility for the current political moment on others, again, especially rural, low-income whites, um, without reflecting on the blame that rightly rests on our own shoulders, the shoulders of elites. Even in the run-up to Trump's election, I saw hateful attitudes expressed on social media, a desire to push aside the Rust Belt voters as a salient part of the electorate or the economy, uh, and a powerful resentment that those voters had ever been framed as real Americans. One tweet um, after the Nevada caucuses talked about how the um, service workers union in Las Vegas were going to save the world, which quite frankly I was feeling at that moment too. Um, and therefore, according to the comment on my Twitter feed, could we please never hear again from the Rust Belt um, and that they are somehow the real Americans. As R.R. Reno wrote on First Things, his blog in early 2016, does the intelligentsia of the Democratic Party let a moment pass without reminding us of the demographic eclipse of white middle class voters? Sometimes they're described as racist or derided as dull suburbanites who lack the elan of the new urban creative class. The message, white middle class Americans aren't just irrelevant to America's political future, they are in the way. Conservatives are no less harsh. I'm still quoting Reno. Editorials, editorials ominously predict that the innovators are about to be overwhelmed by a locust blight of takers. And of course, there's those Kevin Williamson columns from the National <laughs> Review, uh, which I commend to you. Indeed, in the aftermath of the election, elites have a new related complaint. The fact that the mainstream media are paying too much, too much attention to these voters. My Twitter feed is awash with protest every time a mainstream media outlet engages in this Trump country journalistic tourism. Pr Full Frontal with Samantha Bee even did a segment last month satirizing the phenomenon. Meanwhile, critical race scholars on my Twitter feed lament this recentering of whiteness, which I completely understand and sympathize with. I understand the annoyance. But I still think that it's an important enterprise to understand these groups. Indeed, I think it's imperative. In spite of the hateful rhetoric, I hope that we really don't want to leave anyone behind, that we're not writing off anyone, not even rural and working class whites. There's, a, a again, this piece that um, Alec McGillis did in ProPublica after the election. It was titled Revenge of the Forgotten Class, and I commend it to everyone. I think it's one of the most brilliant pieces um, that I've read about the election. And he, he featured a woman named Tracy St. Martin, Miamisburg, Ohio, 54 years old, which incidentally is about my age. Uh, in fact, I find that many of these women, right, they're in their 50s, and I think, in a way, that's what's so jarring, right, is I know that I could have been these women in another life. Had I not gotten to go to college, had I not had the opportunity for an education, so maybe I have some greater capacity to empathize or I, I'm not sure what the right word is, but I find it very jarring. Also, the deaths of despair. Who are the deaths of despair most common among? They are most common among working class white women my age, but women with high school or less education. So anyway, this interview with, with St. Martin is, is amazing. I, I commend it to you because it raises so many of the issues of the day. She admits she's trying to get off opioids. She's got a treadmill in her kitchen. She's a unionized worker. She's suffered all sorts of sexual harassment on work sites over the years. She voted for Obama in 2008. She didn't vote in 2012 because she was away on a job. Um, and uh, she's been a lifelong Democrat. Everybody in her family has been a Democrat. She's a single mom. She's raised three adult daughters. And um, she's leaning towards voting for Trump. And so she's explaining this uh, to McGillis. And I have to say that if you read these interviews with 
these folks in Trumplandia. Watch out for the telltale signs of fake news in the accounts that they give of why they are voting the way they are voting. As I have gone back and read them, the more we have learned about exactly how Russia was targeting populations, the fingerprints are all over the things that these people say. So let me tell you a few things that, that St. Martin says. So St. Martin was leaning towards Trump. Her explanation was this halting but vehement, spoken with pauses and in bursts. She was disappointed in Obama after voting for him. Quote, I don't like the Obama persona, his public appearance and demeanor, she said. I wanted people like me to be cared about. She regretted that she did not have a deeper grasp of public affairs. No one that's voting knows all the facts, she said. Quote, it's a shame. They keep us so fucking busy and poor that we don't have time. I find her acknowledgement that she wasn't up to speed on all of the issues particularly poignant. Indeed, she's a living manifestation of what Joe Badgett has referred to as the absence of the life of the mind, a life in which one has time to consider the issues of the day. But this is a luxury that working class people, by and large, don't have. Here's the part where you just see garbled fake news written all over it. When she addressed Clinton herself, it was in a stream that seemed to refer to, but not explicitly name, several of the charges thrown against Clinton by that point in time, including her handling of the 2012 Benghazi attack, potential conflicts of interest at the Clinton Foundation, and her use of a private email server while serving as Secretary of State, mixing national security business with emails to her daughter Chelsea, whose wedding she was helping to plan. So St. Martin is quoted, to have lives be sacrificed because of corporate greed and warmongering, it's too much for me. And I didn't realize, I, pardon me, and I realize I don't have all the facts, that there's, that there's just too much sidestepping on her, though. I don't trust her. I don't think that. I know there's casualties in war. I'm a big girl. I know that. But I live my life with no secrets. There's no shame in the truth. There's mistakes made. We all grow. She's a mature woman, and she should know that. You don't email your fucking daughter when you're a leader. Leaders need to make decisions. They need to be focused. You don't hide stuff. You know what jumped out at me as I read that? This is a woman who probably couldn't imagine what it would be like to have a desk job where you could do what we do, right? Oh, I'll email my child or I'll, you know, I'll order something from Nordstrom or whatever, right? I mean, we are back and forth. We have that luxury. She could not imagine that Hillary Clinton, she could not imagine having a desk job like Hillary Clinton did, where you could, yeah, you know, be dealing with this and then, you know, take a break and um, help your daughter plan her wedding. I suspect there's also a lot of jealousy there, right? It's a world that she couldn't even imagine, and I suspect it's one where she felt really jealous. It made me wonder, were her adult daughters married? If they were, was there an opportunity to have a a wedding celebration for her daughters? And if so, did she get to play any role in planning it, given the demands of her working class existence? So, read the story, it's amazing. Um, so, like many we heard about in the post-election period, St. Martin had voted for Obama, but at some point had soured on him. Some would quickly conclude that St. Martin is racist for saying she doesn't like Obama's persona, his public appearance, and demeanor. But I'm not sure that it's that simple. I'm not saying that race plays no role. But St. Martin's comments remind me of, ah, J.D. Vance's assessment of his white working class milieu's views of Obama as articulated in Hillbilly Elegy. So I'm going to read this quote from Hillbilly Elegy. I know you had the joy of having him with you just a few days ago. Um, I don't agree with J.D. Vance about very many things, but I do agree in part with what he has to say about this. He says, recall ab about how the folks in Middletown didn't support Obama. He writes, recall that not a single one of my high school classmates attended an Ivy League school. Barack Obama attended two of them and excelled at both. He is brilliant, wealthy, and speaks like a constitutional law professor, which, of course, he is. 
Nothing about him bears any resemblance to the people I admired growing up. His accent is clean, perfect, and neutral. It's foreign. His credentials are so impressive that they're frightening. He made his life in Chicago, a dense metropolis, and he conducts himself with the confidence that comes from knowing that the modern American meritocracy was built for him. Of course Obama overcame adversity in his own right, adversity familiar to some of us, but that was long before most of us knew him. President Obama came on the scene right as so many people in my community began to believe that the modern American meritocracy was not built for them. As I said, this is a rare point on which I agree with Vance, at least to some extent. This is not to say that the visceral negative reactions that many white working class and rural voters have had to Obama at some point is not about race. Let's face it, race and racial bias permeate everything. So does gender and gender bias. But the left's impulse in my world is to make everything about race and to use the racist label extremely liberally, often to the neglect of explicit attention to class, which is one of the things that J.D. Vance was trying to do in that passage. He was talking about class as not only material, but cultural. So if we're going to get out of this highly polarized place in which we now find ourselves, we're going to have to meet swing voters where they are. I'm not talking about white supremacists, neo-Nazis, KKK, right? I'm not trying to reason with them. I'm not making any apologies for them. I'm willing to write them off. They're a group I'm willing to say, I don't care. Go to hell, right? I'm talking about the middle, the so-called swing voters who voted for Trump, and we're talking about a lot of voters here, a lot of them who supported Obama in prior elections. And I don't want to be heard to say, because it's happened before, that if someone voted for Obama, that's conclusive evidence they couldn't be racist. That's not what I'm saying. It's more complicated than that, and I know that. I'm talking, uh, I'm sorry, I'm talking about these voters who are up for grabs, and I'd like to move them back into the progressive column. Walter D. Caserti said today, you know, that he's a, he thinks Trump is going to win the next election. I'm, a, I'm pretty afraid of it myself right now. I don't really see very much movement back to the middle. In fact, I see the left pushing the swing voters in the other direction, and it's, I find it enormously scary. So, again, part of what I'm about to say is about people's perceptions, right? We're so hung up. You, you know that old bit of marital advice? Do you want to be right or do you want to stay married? We are so hell-bent on being right that they're racist that we are throwing opportunities for political conciliation out the window. So people don't like to be told that they're racist. Now, if you're white supremacist, you're KKK, you're neo-Nazi, you're like, yeah, I'm racist, right? But we got this big group of people in the middle, and guess what? They're really pissed off that we're running around calling them racist willy-nilly. So let me read you comments from a couple of them. This is from a woman uh, in Louisville. She referred to a sign that somebody had at a rally. This was before the election. It says we're racist, but I don't see how. I coach teams, and I'm like the United Nations with my teams because their parents are mostly locked up, and they live with their grandparents. And I can tell you what we do for these children. We do more than their parents do. So I'm not racist. We're very giving. And then I love this part. And also, I'm Catholic. <laughs> um, a 39-year-old woman from Gulf Shores, Alabama, who was interviewed by Susan Chira for the New York Times, is Chira did this amazing piece on, uh, uh, titled, uh, You Look for the Good, right? She interviewed all these women, uh, all these white women who'd voted for, for Trump. Um, and so here's one of them. Somebody called me a racist because I did vote for Trump. Hold on, you don't know me. Doesn't that make you a racist by calling me a racist when you don't know me? I'm looking for a brighter future for my children. And then, uh, and honestly, I felt like our country was kind of at risk if we elected Hillary, which just brings the feminist in me, like, to my knees. But anyway, um, 
So it's easy for liberal elites, for law professors, to ridicule these women for being clueless, or whatever term we might choose. But we should probably realize and acknowledge that our understanding of racism is not their understanding of racism. Right? As lawyers, we should know better about the need to define our terms. Right? So law professors in my world use, they say we're all racist, right? Eduardo Bonilla Silva's, right? You know, racism without racist, right? Structural racism, implicit bias. These are concepts that we as learned people are familiar with. Guess what? These people who we're running around calling racist are not familiar with these concepts. They haven't taken the little online thing that helps you understand implicit bias, right? So they think we're telling them that they're the KKK. And they don't want to be the KKK, right? So many of these people, I dare say, have not had the opportunity to learn about the sorts of studies that we take for granted, about things like implicit bias and structural racism. So we should be honest about the fact that when we call them racist, we are not using the term in its broadest sense. Because if we were, we'd be saying we're racist too. That's how racism without racist, that's how it works, right? In fact, we are casting aspersions on them that we are not casting on ourselves. We are not calling ourselves racist, at least that's not what I hear. We are implicitly differentiating ourselves from them by not owning up to our own roles in racism, structural or otherwise. In short, we're doing what Martha Mahoney has suggested that upper, white, upper class whites tend to do. We're projecting our racism onto working class whites, especially Southerners. Here's the quote. Most whites perceive racism as something that a second party, the racist actor, does to a third party, the subordinated person of a minority race. For white Americans of middle class and elite status, the people who write the books and do the social analysis, racism is something that working class whites, particularly Southerners, do to blacks and other people of color. So call me a wimp or a, or a bigot or an apologist for bigots, but if we're going to run around calling everyone racist, we really should define our terms. We should really be a little bit clearer, right? And this is part of the problem, is that there is such a yawning chasm between us and them, and we've had all these years of sort of accumulated highfalutin learning about stuff. And how are we going to, how are we going to, level the playing field in terms of um, the meaning of the terms that we're using? How are we going to start to get them up to speed on what we think we know when we don't have the cultural competency to even speak to them? So, um, as I prepare to close, let me <laughs> return to the wise words of Professor Camille Gear rich from her article, Marginal Whiteness. When scholars talk about white privilege in the abstract without discussing the host of competing identity variables that complicate white privilege, they risk increasing the salience of whiteness for race, for, pardon me, for less race identified whites, the people I'm talking about. We're not talking about the KKK, right? We're talking about people who just, for them, whiteness is transparent, right? So we risk increasing the salience of whiteness for less race-identified whites in a context that gives them an incentive to cling to white identity. So I fear that by running around screaming racist at everybody who's voted for Trump, we are just sending them into the arms of the right. So on the bright side, oh my goodness, is there a bright side? Um, <laughs> I guess I can honestly say that I'm glad that we're finally seeing rural people and that we're finally seeing the white working class. Um, is it possible that being reviled, rejected, and condescended to is preferable to invisibility? I don't know. I'm thinking that rural and white working class people are kind of like the pesky child who misbehaves to get her parents' attention. In this case, the misbehavior was, to my mind, <laughs> disproportionate because it was disproportionate support for Donald Trump. So what will we do in response? Are we going to punish them for their misbehavior, assuming that we, progressives, ever regain power, which might be a big if, <laughs> the way things are looking right now? Are we going to extract our pound of flesh if progressives ever regain sufficient political power to do so? 
right? I see all of this, you know, all of these mentions on social media about, ah, they're going to lose Obamacare. It serves them right, right? Ah, they're getting what they deserve, right? Or are we going to listen to them? Are we going to listen empathically in order to learn what's on their minds and what challenges they're facing? Will we be willing to do what it takes to invest in their futures as well as our own? Or will we be dream hoarders, putting our sanctimonious, politically correct positions above everything else? We may wish to help vulnerable populations, I think most of us do, but can or will we see poor and working class whites as vulnerable? Will we, will be, will we be able to see them as anything more than defilements of whiteness? a great national embarrassment. Okay, I've got two more pages. <laughs> that would sounded like a pretty good close, but why not? Just plow ahead. I see signs that we're willing to take chances, as the Democrats did in 2016, that non-whites will become sufficient in number and political power to put and keep progressives in office in future elections. I see signs that we're willing to write off the white working class and rural voters as part of the Democratic coalition. I hope I'm wrong. Not only is it a risk I think we should not take, it would not be the right thing to do. Do we really want to leave anyone out? Again, excepting the neo-Nazis and the white supremacists, which I'm happy to leave out. David Leonhardt of the New York Times, who pays an extraordinary amount of attention to class, offered this caution in a November 2017 op-ed following Northam's victory in the Virginia, Virginia gubernatorial race. Giving up the white working class would be a terrible mistake. Whites without four-year college degrees make up fully half of the adult population, and they tend to be dispersed rather than packed in small geographic areas, which increases their political powers. Without the white working class, Democrats will need everything else to go spectacularly well to retake the House of Representatives in 2018. In other words, there are strategic reasons, as well as what I consider to be ethical ones, not to write off the white working class. But how do we go forward? Could we agree that no one group is right all the time and that it's not appropriate for one faction to get its way all of the time? Roger Cohen wrote in January of 2017, just before Trump was um, inaugurated, getting America out of its mess begins with the acknowledgement that New York and California do not have a stranglehold on truth any more than Kansas and Missouri do. Out there in God-fearing gun country, there are plenty of smart, upstanding Americans. So I will actually close with some words of wisdom from a prominent black feminist scholar, my colleague Angela Harris, who wrote in her germinal brilliant 1990 much cited law review article, she calls us to recognize that wholeness and commonality are acts of will and creativity rather than passive discovery. She was talking about building cross-racial coalitions among feminists, and I'm talking about building them more broadly. And you know what? It's going to take work. Passive discovery is not going to do the trick. So thank you very much. I look forward to your comments and questions. And I came in under an hour. Look at that. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pruitt, again, and all the panelists that presented today. It was a, it was a fantastic day. <laughs> but I want to remind everybody, that's just day one. We have another day tomorrow. Um, starting at 8.30, there's going to be coffee and light breakfast served in the lobby. And then our first panel starts at 9. So I hope to see everybody there tomorrow. take questions. I know it's late. It's been a really long day. I've been here the whole day myself, so if um, people should certainly feel free to, to file out if you like, but I'm happy to stay and chat. And I'd, again, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes.
for an Apple iPhone, particularly for a white Apple iPhone. Right. Having said that, not understanding that even black Apple iPhones exist. And right. So it's used in blue with right. people of color and Apple iPhones. And so I, I would just say that I would have found it to be a very insightful, and I, I know that having conversations with other SFRs, and I, I think that is the key to being sort of bringing these people together. One of the things I find, yeah, I, I, I had in my notes to say earlier, right, you know, to be very intentional about saying I know there are black Appalachians. I love this. There's this great article called Degradations of Whiteness about, uh, about race in Appalachia, which I commend to all of you. It's by a woman named uh, Barbara Ellen Smith who teaches at Virginia Tech. Uh, and it's really great on, on that point. So I want to, you know, to throw that out there. Sort of like saying, or I mean, in the same, a parallel would be, right, not all Appalachians are rural, right? Not all, not all Appalachians are white or white working class. But on the empathy point, yeah, which is something that I, um, yeah, spend a lot of time thinking about, like what would it look like, you know, given the, how dramatic, right, this, this divide is. And something I, no I started noticing a few years ago is that there are a number of African-American scholars. They tend to be older African-American scholars, but they include Maya Angelou, Bell Hooks, William Julius Wilson, who show enormous empathy for the white working class. So all of them, I believe this is right, right? They, um, like Maya Angelou, for example, even uses the term white trash, but in a, but, in a, um, well, I, I mean, can you use the word white trash compassionately? Um, yeah, I mean, I think she's trying to, but her point, I mean, these are all black people who grew up with really poor whites. And they express a compassion and an understanding for how dire those circumstances of those poor whites were. Um, there's a, uh, I'm gonna, not going to be able to remember the name of the book, but there was a, a study done, actually I think it was by a University of Kentucky PhD student a few years ago about attitudes towards poor white students in a mostly black urban school. And the white teachers thought of the white, the poor white kids, I mean, they just used the, the term white trash, right? Like, oh, those, you know. And the black teachers had far more compassion for the poor white kids. Um, and so isn't that kind of interesting and ironic? There was a, a poll that was um, commissioned by the Washington Post and someone else about a decade ago. And that what they did is they studied the attitudes of people in the District of Columbia uh, about race and mobility. And the net net was that, again, blacks were much more <laughs> compassionate towards all poor people, including poor whites, that even if they had made it, right? Even if they were living in the Gold Coast, right? Um, and the whites are so judgmental of poor whites. So what gives, right? I think this is this, this um, intraracial tension is huge. And it's something scholars have written about. Um, Alec McGillis, again, I'm such a fangirl of his, you know, he wrote a great op-ed in the New York Times in 2015 called Who Turned My Blue State Red? And what he really unpacks is this tension within what is broadly thought of as the white working class. And what it ignores is this tension between the settled, <coughs> the so-called settled working class, like, I'm out there doing my job. I may not have much, but I'm hardworking, so I sort of cling to work as my identity and my sense of worth. And I don't want the white trash to get public benefits. So what we tend to, in my world, thinks that all of the, all of the um, public opposition, all the political opposition to public benefits is about the welfare queen. 
No, 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 right? Look at the people who studied this tension within what outsiders think broadly is just, oh, it's just this monolithic working class. No, within that, within that working class, there are strata that are incredibly meaningful to the people within that class. So the people who, you know, kind of have a leg up at some point, right, even if they previously had very little, they don't, you know, they want everybody to, to um, you know, to be as settled and upstanding and work as hard, and they, they have no, compa there's, there's a real compassion deficit, right, within what we broadly think of as the, as the white working class, and I think it, it's hugely significant. And there's lots of evidence of it, but most people ignore the evidence because it's just so easy to make everything about race, and race certainly matters. I'm not denying that. I've worn you out. <laughs>